Hi, my name is Eric with mobilemusthave.com and liveinlight.net and today we're going to talk about how to add external secondary access points to your Pepwave Max BR1 Mini or Max BR1 MK2. Thanks so much for joining us guys. So as said on in the intro, we're going to be talking about adding secondary access points for additional wireless coverage to your Peplink Max series modem. Now this, this video specifically will be for um, Max BR1 Mini and Max BR1 MK2s that are in our popular entry level bundles. So if you have an essentials bundle or you have a full timer bundle, this video is for you. Um, if you bought the modems without the roof antenna, you can still do everything we're going to talk about today for adding these access points. If you have a different modem and you're not sure which video you want to look at, you can go ahead and ask us and we'll point you in the right direction. But in general, if you look at the spec sheet, uh, what you're looking for is does it have a wireless controller and the controllers allow it to control these access points. These modems do not have controllers so today's video is about showing you how to set up these devices manually to work with the pep links that we're discussing. If you have a speed demon bundle or an ultimate road warrior bundle or any of the transit series modems that we sell go ahead and skip over to the video in the description below specific for how to set up access points for those modems. All right, enough with that, let's get started. Now adding an access point like this is typically sort of a phase two type scenario. Um, for this video, we're gonna assume you've set up the basics on this modem. Uh, so make sure you follow the setup and get start guides that we emailed to you when you purchased the modem uh, to, to kind of take care of the basics. There's also a second video that we have for setting up Wi-Fi best practices. And we'll link that to the description below as well. Now that will sort of baseline the wireless in your device to perform optimally in uh, an RV environment. Kind of reduces the amount of problems that you'll have by setting it up that way and also maximizes the compatibility for devices like printers and smart TVs and other stuff. So get your baseline set up, go ahead and set up your Wi-Fi and then if you're adding access points, this video is for you. So let's talk about the components of what we have here. Uh, we've got uh, these little wires here are power wires. So we've got a power wire running to our PEP wave. Uh, Max, or I'm sorry, this is an AP mini access point. We've got a power run wire here running to our router. We have all of our cellular and Wi-Fi antennas connected. That's very important. The only antenna we're missing here is the GPS antenna. That's the only antenna that's optional when you're working on anything with your PepWave. A lot of customers think, oh, I'll just connect one of these. It'll work. No, it won't. It'll create a ton of interference and you'll have nothing but problems. So connect all those up nice and snug. Don't use a wrench, just hand tighten. So the, the next component we have here is an ethernet cable. And what we're doing is we're uplinking from the LAN as L is in LAN, like, like uh, Lima, over to plug into the access point. Now, what we've got is a solid green status light on our PEP wave here, and we've got a solid green status light on our access point as well. So we're essentially kind of all plugged in and ready for baseline. Now, before we start, I recommend that you do a factory reset on your access points. If you kind of messed around with them before you got to this video, or I don't know, anything just happened, it's just for good measure to prevent you having problems in the future. So what we're gonna do, again, we've got green lights on those status lights, solid green. We're gonna go ahead and take a paper clip and we're gonna insert it there into that reset hole until we hear a click and we're gonna hold it down. We'll get a solid red status light and then we're gonna wait about 15 to 20 seconds. It'll blink red for a while, and then it will go off. Once that light goes off, we know that this has been factory reset. Now we're just gonna wait for about one to two minutes to let it boot back up. Once we get back to the solid green status light, we're ready to start configuring. While we're waiting for that uh, access point to reboot, you may be wondering, do I have to run an ethernet cable from the peplink to the access point? Uh, the answer is no, but you probably should if you can. 
Now, having a wired uplink like this will ensure that the access point can perform optimally and as quick as possible. Um, wired links are always going to be faster. But the PEPLink does support something called wireless uplink or wireless mesh, which means that you can do away with this Ethernet cable and this will act like a repeater, essentially picking up the Wi Fi signal from this and rebroadcasting it in another part of your RV. That's the next video in our series. You have to follow all the steps in this video with the wired cable before you can move on to setting up mesh, but you can do it. All right, so we're back to a solid green light here. We're plugged in, we've got our PEPLink online. Now we're gonna hop over to the computer and connect to the Wi-Fi on the PEPLink. Um, you should already have that all set up again because of the quick start guide. So just connect over to your PEPLink Wi-Fi and then you can follow us on the screen share and we'll show you how to set all this up. All right guys, welcome to my desktop. So first thing we wanna do is connect to our Wi-Fi on the PEPWave and um, if you've got a lot of Wi-Fi networks in the area like I do, this can be challenging when you're doing configuration because computers, especially like Macs, like mine, will hop off of the Wi-Fi you're connected to and just try to jump onto another Wi-Fi in the middle of the configuration process if the PEP wave is rebooting. This is because those computers see the Wi-Fi as being down and go, oh, I gotta get back online, and then they swap over. So if you're having trouble connecting to the management console throughout this process, it's typically because you've made changes to the router or to a device that needs to reboot, or, so you just need to wait if it needs to reboot, or because you've hopped off the Wi-Fi. So always check periodically that you're on the right Wi-Fi while throughout this process. So Smith Family Wi-Fi or Smith Family 2 gigahertz is the name of the Wi-Fi for our test modem. We're gonna hop into the management console of that modem at 192.168.50.1, which is the default. Uh, this may ask you for a username and password. Mine won't because I've already logged into this device. Uh, if you have any questions about accessing the management console, make sure to check out our PepLink quick start guide, which you can find at guides.mobilemusthave.com. Um, or we emailed it to you when you purchased the device as well. Okay, so we've got ourselves here inside of the uh, device. Now again, I'm gonna hop over to the access point tab to show you. We've configured this device using our wireless best practices settings that are in our wireless best practice video, which you'd wanna complete before you get started with this. That separa separates out the two gigahertz and the five gigahertz networks for optimal performance uh, and compatibility. All right, so. As mentioned before in the video, we've got our access point uh, AP mini connected to the LAN port of our device. So we're gonna hop over to status and just show you that that is confirmed uh, under client list. When we go to client list, we'll see this little green arrow that sort of indicates that you have an active connection that it's connected via a wired connection. If you had a little wireless icon, it would be wireless like my computer is. Those are the two devices that this has online. Uh, note this IP address here. That is where the access point is located and we're gonna check that out in a minute. But before we do that, we wanna hop over and copy some settings. So for me, I'm gonna go ahead and open up notes. I'm gonna create a new note and we're going to let's document out some information. So uh, since we're gonna have to manually configure that access point, we're gonna click on the AP tab, go to the two gigahertz Wi-Fi that we have here, and we're gonna wanna copy our SSID exactly. So I'm just gonna write in two gigahertz, well, Wi-Fi settings for my, I'm gonna write SSID, and then I'm gonna say password, and I'm gonna paste that as well. You can go ahead and uncheck hide characters. These are all just test passwords. Um, but everything that we have here is gonna have to match when we set up the next access point. So I'm gonna copy them all down now. All right, so that is all set. I already know that I've got WPA2 personal and all those settings because that was what we set up in our Wi-Fi best practice video. Now I'm gonna hop over into the five gigahertz, do the same thing. We're gonna paste that down here and I'm gonna grab that password as well. Again, WPA personal, no other settings are needed. Great. Now that we've got those two, we've got what we need 
from the access point. Now I'm going to hop over to the status tab again, go to clients, and I'm going to copy this IP address for that access point, and I'm going to open up a new tab. I'm going to paste that in. So now instead of 50.1, we're at 50.10. Now the password for the device when you first log into it is typically public, username admin, password public. It is actually stamped on the sticker on the bottom of your access point. Um, and again, if you can't get in for some reason, make sure to follow that paperclip reset procedure that we showed you at the very beginning of this video. Okay, we're in the Access Points Administration Console, and as you can see, it looks very similar to your Peplinks Administration Console, but they are different devices. So make sure you keep an eye on these tabs and you know which tab you're in. You'll always know by the address here which one is the access point and which one's the router. The router will always be dot one. All right, so now we're going to copy those Wi-Fi settings to this device. But before we do so, do so, I do recommend that you hop into the system tab, click on the firmware button, and check for the latest firmware. This device already has the latest firmware as of June uh, 2021, so we're all set here. Uh, but you can check for firmware and then update it directly there. You just need to make sure that your peplink is online. So let's go ahead and go to the access point tab and we're going to create new SSIDs. In this case, I'm going to hop over to my notepad and I'm going to copy exactly what I had in the other one. Now these are potentially case sensitive so you want to make sure you get everything exact, spaces, dashes, capitals, everything identical to ensure that your devices don't see these as different Wi-Fi networks. You also need to make sure that your security matches as well. So we're selecting everything based on what we saw in the last modem and everything in accordance with our Wi-Fi best practices. Do not copy my Wi-Fi password. This is just an example password. Pick your own, but you have an idea. We have a capital here, numbers, and a symbol um, as an example. We don't recommend you use an exclamation point as a symbol. Everyone guesses that. So now we've got our two gigahertz set up. That's pretty much everything we need there. And we're gonna go ahead and hit save. Then we're gonna add our next SSID here, which is our five gigahertz. We're going to go ahead and hit WPA personal. We're going to paste in that same password we have. Make sure that you match up your passwords. And we're going to hit save again. And then we're going to go ahead and delete the default PepWave Wi-Fi here. All right. We're not going to apply changes quite yet. We're going to hop over into the settings tab. And we, because we've got the Smith family two gigahertz, and the five gigahertz, we want them to run on the correct network. So two gigahertz, we check two, five gigahertz, we check five. This again, all based on the Wi-Fi best practices. Um, if you didn't follow our best practices, then you need to make sure that these settings match up with whatever is on your router on the same tab. Okay, great. We've got that saved and we're gonna go ahead and hit apply changes and wait for the device to reboot. Okay, now that's pretty much it for setting up the devices. At this point, you can relocate your secondary access point, let's say 15, 20, 25 feet away from your primary for optimal use. Again, you're going to need that Ethernet cable to connect them, or you can um, hop over to our wireless mesh, wireless uplink video next to remove that cable. Now, I'm just going to bring up a wireless analyzer here to kind of see, show you what's going on. This might bounce around a little bit because um, I've got these two access points very close together. So they're probably fighting quite a bit being about a foot apart. But as you can see here, we've got Smith Family Wi-Fi 2 gigahertz and Smith Family Wi-Fi 2 gigahertz. This is operating on channel 11 and this is operating on channel 6. However, they're so close together that it's not 100% sure what's going on. They keep bouncing up and down. So that gives you an idea of why you need to make sure you've got your access points far apart. Um, 
Up here, if you look, I am connected to the two gigahertz. We do not have two networks listed. So they are running on the same SSID and they are broadcasting from both devices. They're just a bit too close together. Now, if you want, you can, or if you're experiencing challenges or issues, you can hard set your channels to avoid them hopping around if they're set to auto. Typically, auto works well just because people move into different campgrounds and certain channels will be very saturated. Uh, so when you move, it may affect what works better or not. But there's nothing wrong with hard setting the channels if you want. You just may have to go in and pop and check, uh, pop in and check uh, to make sure they're running on on a channel that's not super saturated in your area. Uh, under the AP tab, under settings, you can click the channel button for two gigahertz on this left column. We recommend one, six, or 11. Those are the, those are the uh, channels that are furthest apart so they don't overlap. Uh, and then you can do the same in five gigahertz. Oop, that's the wrong one. 36, 149, 165 are good channels that also don't over overlap, um, for an example. If you hard set a channel in your access point, let's say to channel one, then you're going to want to go into your PAP link under access point, and you're going to want to hard set your channel there as well under say channel six. You don't want to hard set them on the same channel uh, because they will most likely interfere with themselves since they're going to be in fairly close proximity in your RV. The next thing I want to discuss from a troubleshooting perspective is that if you are having connectivity dropouts or any issues, you can go ahead and check check your channel width and drop this down to 20 megahertz. Um, this will reduce the amount of bandwidth that you have on your wireless, but it will also decrease the number of challenges or problems because it's simplifying how the Wi-Fi network works. So you can go ahead and do that uh, during troubleshooting, see if that resolves any issues, and then you can you know, try 40 megahertz or auto and see if that recreates the issue. Uh, typically for RV use, moving it down to 20 megahertz is still more than enough bandwidth for all the devices you have to run and operate uh, you know, without issue. But that is an interesting uh, troubleshooting step that you can um, enable if you're having some dropout issues or connectivity issues with a particular device. That may be common or that may be useful if you've got an older printer or a smart TV or something that's just not connecting to the Wi-Fi. Dropping that channel width can often resolve that issue. All right, so you've configured the basics on your wireless access point, and it's uh, good to go at this point. So we're going to want these to be at least, probably at least 20 feet apart or so. Uh, to ensure that the wireless coverage from each of them kind of optimally balances your clients as they connect. Um, as a reminder, if you're following just this video, you're going to need to continue to have this Ethernet cable connected. So you're going to have to run that to the location for this access point, and you're going to have to have the unit powered. Now, if you're interested in continuing to run just Ethernet, you can look at our 8-port PoE switch or our one port 12 volt PoE injector. That'll take the 12 volts from your house battery and it will provide the power wire this over the ethernet cable. So that's an option for folks that just wanna run the one ethernet cable. We do have some options since these modems do not supply power over the ethernet. Now that you've followed the basic setup instructions for configuring an external access point, you can look to enable mesh or wireless uplink to remove this ethernet cable. You're still gonna need power. Uh, these have to be powered somehow, but there are options for powering the device, not just with using this AC adapter that we do talk about in the mesh video. So now that you've completed this step, you can move on to mesh wireless uplink using the link below. And that's it guys, thank you so much for watching. Again, I know I've said it a bunch before, but this is part of a multi-part video series. So make sure you follow in the steps as necessary. If you're just about you know, done with this, the next video in the, in the series would be setting up the wireless uplink, if applicable. You don't need to do that if you're planning on keeping this ethernet cable. Thank you so much and we'll see you on the road.